UBC's chapter of Saikai acknowledges that it operates on UBC's infrastructure, which is located on the traditional, ancestral, and unceded territory of the Musqueam people. Please appreciate the meaning behind the statement as we move forward with the Labyrinth podcast. Hello, everyone. My name is Ananya, and I am the executive coordinator for UBC's chapter of Saikai, the International Honor Society in Psychology. We are back today with another insightful episode on the labyrinth. Today, we are speaking with the UBC's Emotion and Self Lab, honored to welcome Principal Investigator Dr. Jessica Tracy and graduate student Eric Mercadante. How are you both doing today? I'm good, thanks. I'm doing great as well. Awesome. Thank you so much for joining us here. To get things started, I would love if you, Dr. Tracy, could give our listeners a quick rundown on what the Emotion and Self Lab is and what your research is all about. Totally. Um, So let's see. So basically, we are in the social personality area of the psych department, Mm -hmm. um, which means, you know, we study why people are the way they are and why they behave the way they do in very broad strokes. Um, In our lab, the focus is mainly on emotions and the self. So we study emotions in all of their different aspects, what they feel like, what they look like when people show them with their faces and their bodies, what causes different emotions. And then we study the self. So what it means to have a self, self self-esteem, how people develop a self-concept. And then the thing that we kind of really specialize in is sort of the intersection between emotion and self, which you can think of as self-conscious emotions. So emotions that we feel that are all about the self, like pride, shame, and guilt. Mm -hmm. Um, So that's kind of broad strokes what we do, but we've got projects on personality, on uh, all different kinds of emotions, on narcissism, on morality, moral behavior, um, how emotions affect morality. So it's fairly broad, but all kind of centered around topics related to emotion and self. Mm -hmm. Interesting. And I wanted to know what was your motivation in indulging in this field of study? So why, why emotion and why study your sense of self? Um, so, you know, this is stuff I got into back way back when, when I was in grad school and, um, you know, I, I was really interested in studying emotions. I kind of knew from day one of grad school that that was what I wanted to do. And for me, it was because I, I realized how important emotions are in terms of motivating pretty much everything we do, I think is driven by some emotion or another. And, um, and when I knew I wanted to study psychology, I always kind of wanted to start at the most basic level. So, you know, you, you, I would hear about people studying relationships or groups and, and that stuff is fascinating, but my perspective was always, how can you study at that level of things you know, when we don't even know the most basic things about what's motivating the internal psychological processes of one right. person, right? Mm-hmm. So combining that, that's sort of what got me into emotions. And then, you know, where I went to grad school, my advisor, Rick Robbins, his specialty was the self and self-esteem. And so he sort of said, why don't we combine emotions and self? And there's this big gap in the literature because we really at that point did not know a whole lot about self-conscious emotions. Right. So that's kind of how it started and it took off from there. Awesome. That's very cool. Mm-hmm. Um, I bet it's a lot of a um, psychology majors like uh, often they just say like we always knew we were wanting to get into psychology and we just always you know thought that in school um, we just want to hear about people's problems or you know be the problem solver and then now most of them are finishing their degree and we're like okay wait like what do we want to get into like, <laughs> you know how do we start yes yeah, it's, it's super hard to know you know I think I never wanted to solve people's problems because I didn't know if I could be good at that. <laughs> and so mm-hmm. I, for me, it was more just a general interest in, in how, do this, how does the mind work and what drives people to do what they do and, and what makes people different from one another. Those kind of basic questions really affected mm-hmm. me. Mm-hmm. So in line with discussing your projects and um, like the nitty gritties of what you do, I came across a super interesting publication in regard to mate preferences and shame attractiveness effects. And so I was wondering if you could tell our listeners a little bit about the most impactful implications of the work you did in 2011 and then 2013 to 15, I believe. Yeah, totally. So this is work led um, by and and in collaboration with a former grad student of mine, Alec Beale, um, who was in the lab for a while. He actually was an undergrad at UBC and then went on to be a grad student in my lab. Um, And so I was lucky to have um, I was lucky to have him around for a while. He was fantastic. Some of you might know him from Big Brother Canada. He was on season one. So he's oh, actually like a cool celebrity, mm-hmm. uh, Alec. <laughs> um, <laughs> anyway, um, Alec is, is a really smart guy. He now, uh, he kind of left the field and works in industry, but um, 
he's great. And he really was interested in how different emotion expressions uh, affected how attractive people were. He studies attractiveness and mate, mate preferences and all that kind of thing. And so we did the study and we found that um, there are these major gender differences. And it, it actually is kind of interesting. Um, the most attractive emotion expression we found that men can show is pride. And that's not particularly surprising because pride is all about high status and right. you know, looking big and whatever. For women, showing pride is like super unattractive, it turns out. Also not surprising because there's long been kind of a bias against high status women. Mm -hmm. um, so that all made sense. But then we found these other findings that were more surprising. So smiling, happiness, super attractive in women, like the most attractive thing women can do. Smiling in men, super unattractive. Like <laughs> basically <laughs> the worst thing a guy can do if, if he's trying to look good to a mate. So that, that was really interesting um, and surprising. And then I think the most surprising thing was what you mentioned, shame. So right. we expected that women who show shame would be considered attractive because being sort of demure, um, shy, that's kind of, you know, throughout history, uh, been a thing that women are supposed to do. And for evolutionary reasons, it's sort of about low status. Um, and so we did find that, but the amazing thing was that shame was also attractive when men showed it. And that was surprising because, you know, like I said, men are supposed to be high status. We like it when they show pride. It's just, we also like it when, when they show shame. And so Alec and I wondered, okay, is this evolved? Is this an evolved preference? Is this sort of part of human nature? Is there something adaptive? for women to go for men who show shame? Does it sort of send a message that you're likely to be a viable mate? It doesn't really make sense that it would because you know it's much more adaptive for women to mate with people who are high status than low status. Right. So we did a cross-cultural study to see whether it's universal. Um, we did a study on MTurk with uh, people from India because there's, there's a large number of Indians on MTurk available to participate in research studies. Mm -hmm. And in fact, we found that in India, no, guys who show shame are not considered particularly attractive. So it doesn't seem to be universal. We then did a study where we looked at whether it varies depending on um, conception risk. So there's all these studies showing that when women are at highest risk for conception, which is to say when they're ovulating, mm -hmm. the preferences that they show in mating are more aligned with preferences that would be adaptive from an evolutionary perspective. Because of course, that's the time of the month when women can actually get pregnant and any, right. you know, sexual activity they have will lead to offspring. So we thought, okay, well, if, if they're particularly attracted to shame guys, then that suggests it is adaptive. And in fact, we found exactly the opposite. So during ovulation, women are no longer attracted to guys who show shame, <laughs> suggesting that it's really not an evolutionary thing. It doesn't generalize across cultures. And so our kind of takeaway was maybe this is something specific to North American culture. Oh, we also did, I should say, among older women. So past the age of um, uh, basically like, women who no longer could get pregnant. Essentially, I basically asked my stepmom to do a survey and asked her <laughs> to do a survey. So it was sort of like, you know, women in their 60s and 70s filling out the survey. They also did not find shame guys attractive. So our conclusion was, is it's basically sort of a, a cultural phenomenon of Western culture. And we kind of linked it up to um, sort of the James Dean, if you can go back in time, or um, our more current version was Edward the Vampire from the Twilight movies, mm -hmm. where it's like, he's kind of the bad guy or kind of a bad boy but he like feels bad about it. So he like tilts his head down. Um, I feel like Justin Bieber does a pose like this, right? It's sort of the like, you know, I'm bad, but I know it. And there is a message that's being sent there that's very attractive, which is to say like, I might be risky. I might be kind of exciting, but also I am willing to sort of conform to your norms of culture. And I know that I'm bad. And, and that's sort of like both dangerous and safe at the same time, which might be particularly appealing. So mm -hmm. anyway, that's that finding. <laughs> Super interesting. Um, um, yeah, I love that you did like this cross cultural study and, you know, verified in India because a lot like a bizarre number of Western study conclusions are just absolutely not applicable in the East. And then mm -hmm. they're out there still studying the same jargon, still studying the same literature. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah, no, cross cultural research is super important. And we do a lot of it in the lab in general, too. Mm -hmm. so. yeah. Nice. Um, I would like to now shift focus of our discussion towards student involvement at your lab. I'm sure most of our listeners are mainly here to hear about whether they can get involved in all this exciting research you've just spoken about. And I would love if Eric can answer this next question. Um, we want to know about the number of incoming student recruits that the Emotion and Self Lab has each academic year. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for sure. Um, so. The way that um, kind of students join the lab is they typically join uh, one grad student kind of group. Um, so in our lab, which might be a bit different than uh, some of the other labs on campus, 
Mm -hmm. um, we don't have these sort of like big uh, lab projects that all the grad students are working on. Um, the grad students work a bit more individually um, on projects that they lead independently. Mm -hmm. um, so I have projects and then, um, you know, other grad students in our lab, Zach and Gordon and Ian have different projects and undergraduate students who join um, would sort of work with one of us on, on one of our projects. Um, and, and the exact number varies um, just based on sort of uh, how many students um, we need at the moment for whatever those projects are and the projects vary a lot as well. Um, so I would say probably the four of us probably each work with between maybe like five and 10 uh, research assistants every year. So in the lab as a whole, um, that would bring us to somewhere yeah you know, between like 20 and 40. Um, but again, it's, it's pretty variable um, based on sort of what projects are going on and, and how many grad students are in the lab as well. Right. Okay, well, it's, it's just relieving to know, I bet for listeners that there is an ample amount of opportunity and there's so many postings that they can, you know, go after. Mm -hmm. Um, I wanted to ask you next, what is the extent of the undergraduate research assistants involvement in your lab? So what are their mm -hmm. typical duties that they perform or are expected from them? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so again, this is another one that's, uh, you know, going to be really different based on the project. I would say there's sort of three classes um, or three kinds of things that RAs in our lab generally do. Mm -hmm. um, so the first, and, and obviously things are different now with the pandemic, but uh, in non-pandemic times, the kind of primary thing research assistants help with is running experiments. Um, so for all of our listeners who have uh, been in HSP studies, uh, you probably know what this looks like a little bit. Um, the research assistants are responsible for kind of organizing the session. So setting up whatever experimental materials need to be set up. Uh, and then also kind of instructing the participants through the experiment or the study and answering their questions, um, you know, getting consent and, and doing debriefing afterwards and things like that, um, which is a really great kind of hands-on way to experience the research process, I think, mm -hmm. and really understand sort of how the studies you learn about in your classes um, really are, are carried out um, by researchers. Um, and I think, you know, one kind of exciting thing about that is it sort of demystifies science a little bit um, and you can really just sort of see kind of what our day-to-day -day is like and how those things lead to the uh, eventual uh, kind of research that, that gets published and that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. um, another really common uh, thing in our lab is uh, what we call coding um, and this can take a lot of different forms. Um, so one of our one of the graduate students in our lab, Zach, um, is really interested in nonverbal behavior um, so in a lot of his studies, there's pictures of people or videos or things like that. And so, um, you know, his research assistants might be asked to kind of code those pictures or those videos, um, which could be things very objective. So like, you know, which, what angle is this person's head at or something like that um, versus more subjective things. So does this person look happy? Do they look upset? Um, you know, kind of going back to our, our focus on emotion. Um, in my work, we'll also do similar coding, um, but it tends to be narrative coding. So kind of coding, uh, the, you know, things that participants have written. So how much is this person talking about feeling successful? How much is this person talking about feeling afraid um, and sort of getting like a holistic sense? Um, so I think those tasks can be uh, exciting. And, you know, you really get kind of uh, hands-on experience with actual data and, and understanding how we kind of um, you know, make these judgments about things participants say or, or write. Um, and then I would say the last thing that uh, can happen sometimes depending on the study and, and maybe is just coming to mind because this is something that my research assistants are doing a lot of right now is actually working as a confederate. Um, so what that involves is actually being part of the study um, and kind of pretending to be another participant. And so oftentimes we will um, ask the confederate to act in a specific way and then that's you know part of the experiment is their behavior right they're sort of something that the participant is now responding to so i would say that's sort of i think that that covers most things that uh that research assistants get up to in our lab awesome wow 
I would love, I would love to be a confederate. <laughs> we read about these studies, but it just seems so exciting when you could actually do it. Um, mm -hmm. You're also one of the first few labs that I've heard about using their RAs as confederates. So that's awesome. Mm -hmm. um, next up, I wanted to ask a question um, that mostly worries a lot of our applicants. Um, and so if somebody does not have prior research experience, what is the relevant experience that you, Dr. Tracy, look for in the resume of an undergraduate student that may help them stand out? And Eric, you can also go at this question if you like. I mean, I'm, I'm curious to hear what Eric would say. From my perspective, you know, we often take students who don't have prior experience because of course the only way to get experience <laughs> is to get right, experience. Right, right. Um, and, you know, we're totally open to that kind of thing. And we understand that, you know, you have to start somewhere. Um, and mm -hmm. we're happy for that to be our lab if, if, if it's a good fit in other ways. Uh, I guess I would say, you know, we might start people doing a different kind of task if they have no experience versus if they have a lot of experience. Eric can speak more to that. I would say that's definitely the case within the lab. So if you start in the lab, work for us for the one semester, you know, you might be doing things like data entry, kind of less exciting tasks. But once you get a lot of experience, then, you know, if you're interested, we'll find something more exciting and interesting. And eventually, you know, you might go up to the point where you're leading projects on your own or, you know, doing a direct mm -hmm. studies class and, and that kind of stuff. So there's certainly advancement within the lab. Right. Um, I'm not sure if we you know, sort of take into account whether people have prior experience in other labs when deciding what their position in our lab should be, but Eric can probably speak more to that. Yeah, I think, you know, if they have research experience, it's, it's certainly something that we'll, we'll talk about and we'll ask them about, um, but yeah, I, I'd echo everything uh, Jess just said, that's certainly not um, a requirement or anything like that, because um, that would, you know, make things impossible. Um, one thing we do look for is that they uh, have completed certain courses, um, so specifically the research methods course um, that I think all of the psych majors um, yep. are required, right? Yeah, I think that course, um, for people who haven't had any research experience yet, you kind of get a nice background, um, very broad in, in, you know, how research works from that uh, course, and, and usually... Um, you know, that, that prepares students uh, for uh, kind of a first step into the lab. And, and like Jeff said, um, you know, right, for people with less experience, they might do different things compared to people with more experience when they first join. Um, but, you know, everybody uh, who sticks around can definitely make it to the point um, where they can kind of get to, to more advanced uh, tasks or, or doing uh, directed studies or an honors um, where you can actually get to, to leading your own project and doing research that way. Right. Um, just for our listeners, the research course that Eric just mentioned is Psych 217. And you can most typically complete it once you have secondary standing. And so for all our young listeners, I want to say, make sure you have your 217 grades looking great. Um, Eric, I just wanted to follow up and check in. 218 mm -hmm. is also considered a very important course, but it is very statistics heavy. And I was just wondering if that's something the motion and self lab values too. Uh, yeah, I think that's something that, um, you know, we, we're happy to talk about uh, and, you know, obviously looks good on a resume and something we would discuss with potential applicants. Um, I think the, the methods course is something we would look at as more essential, I would say. Um, knowledge of stats is, is really important. Uh, it doesn't have as much to do with sort of the kind of day-to-day -day tasks that research assistants do in our lab. Mm -hmm. um, so I wouldn't say that that uh, kind of statistical background is, is super important. Um, but I think for students who are interested in going to grad school one day, that is definitely uh, something you'll want to take quite seriously. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I second that. I'm in my last year and I'm only now realizing the importance of statistics. <laughs> okay, so to flip that question now, um, what is a quality or an aspect of a particular application that's sort of like a deal breaker? And I asked this today because there's this extremely popular narrative among applicants that if they don't have an average of say 80%, they're not eligible to apply to labs. And so I wanted some clarity for our listeners um, mm -hmm. on this notion and like, what do both of you think about this? 
Yeah, I think that is uh, not accurate. I, I don't, we're not, at least in our lab, um, we don't have any sort of grade cutoff or anything like that. And in my experience, at least, um, I've had uh, really great experiences working with students um, whose grades weren't as high as some of the other students when they first joined the lab. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that's, you know, grades are important. It's something we'll take a look at. Uh, it's not a, a, a deal breaker by any means. Um, if a student has struggled in, in some courses in the past, um, you know, we there's a lot more that, that goes into those decisions than just looking at grades. So yeah, I think that uh, that narrative is, is not totally accurate, at least for our lab. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was going to say the same thing as Eric, that, you know, grades are one factor, but there's so many other factors. And if you really want to get research experience and you're worried about your grades not being high enough, there's a lot of things you can do to try to make up for that. I mean, you know, what I would suggest is um, if you can really make it clear that you're interested and in why. So, you know, email our lab manager, and, and I'm sure you'll get to this, but email our lab manager um, and explain why, or, or me, and I'll forward it to her, you know. <laughs> but explain why you're interested in the lab, what you're excited about, you know, and, and make the email really good, right? Because if you take time and write a really high quality email that's like grammatically clear and, you know, all that kind of thing, that shows us a lot more than a good grade could, um, you know, that you're conscientious, that you're hardworking, that you care about the topic. And, and to me, that matters way more than grades. So anyway. Mm -hmm. um, I'm sure our listeners will be a little bit relieved to hear that um, because it's just like this super common thing I find a lot of second and third years discussing and I'm like no like give your shot mm -hmm. try you know mm -hmm. okay awesome thank you both for that um I now want to shift our focus to the next stage of the hiring process the interview um we want to know what is a common yet important question you like to ask during um a typical research assistant interview and what attitudes do you believe an ideal applicant would possess um, when responding to this question? Eric, do you want to handle that one? Yeah, I can, I can give it a shot. Um, I think sort of the question, at least the first one that came to mind uh, when you asked this question, mm -hmm. uh, we like to ask sometimes, you know, like uh, if, if something were to go wrong, sort of how would you handle it? Um, so, right, you show up for your session um, where you're the experimenter, and you're setting everything up and you know the computers just won't turn on um, or something like that. You know, maybe there's uh, the doors locked or something and there's no key or something like that, right? Um, so I think what we're typically looking for in those kinds of answers um, are you know, people who kind of think on their feet um, and uh, you know, oh, okay, like this is working. Uh, let me get in contact with Eric. Let me see what's going on. Um, you know, maybe and that kind of thing. So sort of uh, kind of, you know, making, having some agency to uh, respond to sort of things that come up or things that go wrong um, is, is a really important quality. Uh, and I think the other thing that we would sort of look for, um, and then Jeff just mentioned this before too, uh, just that the person is, is excited and, and, you know, really interested in our research Right. Um, so I think sometimes, you know, um, you get research assistants uh, or people will come in for interviews and, and they want to get involved in some research um, and they've sort of just picked our lab because maybe, you know, it was the first one mm -hmm. that came up uh, when they Googled it or something like that. And it's not, their interests aren't really specific to what we are studying. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's the kind of thing where, you know, it's almost like a, a disservice on our part um, to bring them on board when, you know, they, it's really important for them to know like what they're gonna get out of it and that they'll mm -hmm. be interested in the things we're studying and, and you know, that the psychology is such a broad field, right? There's right. so much that you can be interested in um, that, you know, we really want to make sure for both our sake and the applicant's sake um, that, you know, the, our lab is a, is a good fit and that they're not just looking to get any research experience, however that's possible. Um, so I would just say to people who are interested in joining labs, um, there's so many great opportunities here at UBC, uh, so many awesome labs to join. Um, so just kind of be thorough in your research because your experience in different labs will be really different um, and it'll be better for both kind of the lab and for you if, if you find one that fits really nicely. Right. 
you spoke about agency as well. And I just um, would love if you could comment on the nature of work that REs do in terms of how independent versus collective their duties are at your lab. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, it really depends on the task. And I think uh, the, we'll always start everything, no matter what task, very collectively. Mm -hmm. um, so like when we do the, the coding thing that I mentioned before, like the first step is that we all meet, we all talk about what we're doing, make sure everyone's on the same page about right. sort of what the concepts are, what we're looking for. Um, and then the same thing for running experiments, right? When that first starts, uh, the RAs will practice with each other. Um, so there's a lot of uh, kind of communality there. We're definitely working as a team to get everybody kind of at the same level, right? Standardization is something that's really important in research. So we wanna make sure that, you know, one RA runs the study the exact same way the other RA does so that there's not differences in mm -hmm. the data based on who the experimenter was. Um, mm -hmm. So we spend a lot of time together all sort of getting onto the same page, uh, thinking up. And then uh, after that, sort of once projects are kind of in the motion, it can become a lot more independent. So. Um, once we're all on the same page, then it's sort of like, all right, you know, sort of let everybody go. Uh, we'll run studies, you know, we'll run participants until we get to our sample size. And, you know, oftentimes when the, uh, because of all the training that happens beforehand, there's not too much sort of checking up that we have to do right. uh, once people know what they're doing. Awesome. Um, next, I want to move past the interview stage, and I just want our listeners to know a little bit more about the common mistakes that applicants tend to make besides the interview stage. Mm -hmm. Eric, do you? <laughs> I'm, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm thinking as well. I think it's tough. Um, maybe kind of the those things I mentioned before, sort of not being super specific to our lab um, or things like that. Um, I, I think the largest constraint, honestly, on um, how many people we bring on board is, is just how much work there is for the research assistant. Um, so a lot of the time, um, you know, we just, we only have maybe four, four people's worth of, of work to give out. Um, mm -hmm. So, you know, your applicants could be kind of suited for um, a position, but it might, you know, maybe someone else is just a bit better suited, right? And, and that's unfortunate, but that happens a lot. Um, so I think there aren't too many things that come to mind um, besides those things I mentioned before about sort of uh, not really having uh, as much kind of like ability to think on their feet or, or showing uh, like a, a really strong, like an interest in our lab specifically would probably be the things that at least come to my mind as far as uh, situations where it doesn't work out. Um, but we are definitely just constrained by, you know, how much there is to do as well. Right. And I think that is something um, that's rather important to highlight for young undergraduate students, especially that um, we are a huge faculty, we're a huge major. And so there is like a big, big, big bunch of psychology students and there's only so many RA positions. So often students feel disheartened because they didn't get in. And sometimes it's just because of the sheer number of people the lab can afford to take on board and it's nothing per se about their application. So I think I think it's good to hear that too. Yeah, and you know, if, if that happens to you, apply again next semester, or next year, because mm -hmm. things are always changing and opening up, so. Yeah, definitely. Awesome. Um, my next question um, pertains to listeners and their final, final years of study, and it might be a little bit of a selfish question, but if <laughs> students discover and find your work interesting, but they're in their, say, fourth or final year of study, does the Emotion and Self Lab hire alumni for volunteer and RA positions? Oh, totally. Um, <laughs> yeah, I mean, we've had a number of people who have graduated who mm -hmm. uh, Still kind of hanging around or maybe taking a class or you know whatever they're doing before they move on to their next thing and those people are fantastic RAs because you know they ha they have a full education they've got a lot of experience they often are you know really serious about it so yeah we're, we're totally open to that kind of thing mm -hmm. in fact I would also say like when we're looking for a lab manager that's exactly the kind of person that we like to hire is someone who's either in their final year or just graduated um, because you know those are sort of people who have a lot of experience know how the department works and so on, but maybe are not quite ready to figure out what they're doing with their life, not ready for grad school or whatever mm -hmm. comes next. 
Um, and so that's that was the case with our current lab manager, Callista. Um, she was an undergrad in our lab, then she graduated, and now she's going on to grad school, but she's been fantastic. So mm -hmm. yeah. shout out to Callista. I have reached out to her <laughs> really a bunch of times too. Awesome. Okay, that's that's great to hear. Um, my next question is COVID related. Um, because of the pandemic, many labs stopped looking for RAs due to hindered in-person work. And I just wanted to know how do you, Dr. Tracy, look at this situation? And when do you think that your lab will be hiring new RAs? Oh, we're hiring like currently. I think Eric just reached out to someone today or is going to who reached out to us um, because our research has definitely not stopped. It's changed. Mm -hmm. You know, we're not yeah. doing in person right now, but we're doing tons of stuff online. And, um, you know, I have these awesome grad students like Eric who figured out ways of doing the kinds of research that we do online and making it work, which has been awesome. And um, it's been really great that I think since even the very beginning, undergrads have been super into taking on online RA duties, which, mm -hmm. you know, lack the, you don't get to hang out in the lab, you don't get to like interact with grad students and other undergrads. So it, it's really kind of not nearly as fun but I guess when people are kind of looking for something to do and trying to, you know, fill up ways of, of meeting requirements, given the situation, I think it is, it, it's an option out there. And so we found lots of ways to put RAs to work online and Eric can speak more specifically to what that has been, but yeah, we're kind of hiring, you know, at, as needed all the time, but we definitely do the most hiring at the beginning of a new semester and the most, most at the beginning of the fall term. So, you know, if you're not sure and you want to apply to our lab, reach out to us in August or September. That's absolutely the best time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, it's definitely been um, an, an interesting transition uh, sort of my experience with doing research uh, online. So, you know, we had um, this nice in-lab study going, uh, you know, about a year ago um, where we're having participants have a face-to-face -face interaction, um, you know, in the lab and, and all that stuff. And, and we were really liking that study. Uh, we ran, I think, about 75 people, and then, uh, you know, the, the pandemic happened, and, and we had to switch online. So it, at first, you know, it's, it's sort of just a whirlwind. You're just thinking about, okay, you know, what's the, how do we, how are we going to get back to, you know, something like this? Um, and there's, you know, all sorts of solutions. Um, so we had uh, a study where we had participants interact over um, a program called Chatplat, which is like an instant messenger. Mm -hmm. um, now we've, we're having participants interact over Zoom. Um, so trying to get, you know, as close as we can to those real person interactions. And, and um, you know, there is definitely uh, a lot of tech that helps us out. Um, so yeah, that stuff, um, I think you are, you, you're, what you said is correct in that it, it sort of reduces um, how many uh, people we need for each session. So like, for example, when this study was in person, we had one experimenter and one confederate. So there's two participants or two uh, research assistants at every session. Now we don't need the experimenter because right, the online experiments kind of run themselves. Um, so we just need one research assistant. Um, so we can run more sessions and that kind of stuff. Um, and then, and the RAs that I've had, um, so Rachel Zhao and Jenny Mokel, uh, two in particular, who have been uh, on the team kind of for this whole time while we've been doing all this crazy stuff, have been so awesome. Um, and they're such kind of great leaders in the lab teaching new research assistants how to, um, you know, kind of do these interactions uh, in, in a way that's, that's pretty difficult, right? We, we all train sort of in person right. um, and then training online is, is quite different. Um, so it's been a challenge for everybody. Um, but I've been super impressed with how all of the uh, research assistants have kind of adapted to this challenge um, and have really still kind of given it their all, even though, you know, it's not really what they signed up for uh, originally. Um, but yeah, it's, it's definitely been different. Um, but, you know, every sort of problem is, is, you know, a new opportunity to to find out something, you know, do something another way or learn a new skill. So trying to think about it that way um and yeah it's you know it's been a it's been a tough year across the board for everybody research is so different of course yeah mm -hmm. awesome um so just a quick question that popped into my head right now I myself was like doing you know my HSB study yesterday getting my credits and things like that and I realized I was in a testing, I was supposed to be in a testing environment, but I had five people in my room and I was doing the online survey. And you mentioned like not requiring 
you know, an experimenter anymore because the online studies run themselves. And so I was just wondering what the lab is doing about the new confounds you're finding due to COVID and due to all even online studies being like done at home and not even in, you know, a room where there's right. like control. Yeah, that the lack of control is, is certainly something right. that um, we worry about with these online studies. Um, mm -hmm. It's tough, right? There's really not a great solution um, as far as what we can do to make sure people are there and attentive and doing everything. Um, so one thing that we include in our studies is what we call attention check. Mm -hmm. um, so we might have, you know, a question where we're not really interested in the answer. What we're interested in is that you'll follow the directions that are in the question, um, which might be, you know, sort of weird or strange, right? And so for that, you know, um, basically what we're doing is just trying to get a sense of how closely people are reading the study materials, how closely they're thinking about everything. And it would never impact anyone's credits or anything like that. It's just something for us to know about when we're looking at the data later on. Right. Um, so those kinds of solutions um, are uh, effective for online research. They're certainly not perfect. Um, there's a lot of control that can really only happen when we're when we're back in person in the lab. Um, yeah. So we, I know at least I'm very you know I'm excited for uh, that you know when that becomes a, a possibility again because there is a lot of yeah I think you know sort of from our end of it we we you know spend some time or at least I spend some time getting sort of stressed and anxious about the fact that we really don't know what's going on on the other side of the screen and uh, at least I haven't found a, a great way to deal with it yet. Right, right. But I'm, I'm sure it's not just, I'm not your lab for sure. I've been doing studies from different labs and it's sort of the same thing. It is, it is a big challenge and hopefully things start resuming in prison soon. But just, just to reiterate for our listeners, the Emotion and Self Lab is hiring right now and they hire as and when. So please apply and fall is the time you have to look out for. Um, mm -hmm. I just have one last question for Dr. Tracy. Actually, I'm going to ask you something too, Eric, but I would mm -hmm. love to hear from Dr. Tracy about what it is that she loves the most about being a researcher. And then Eric, you can give us your input on what's your most favorite thing about being a graduate student at this lab right now. Okay. <laughs> um, well, being a researcher is awesome. Um, I would say mm -hmm. the best thing about it is that you know, if you're someone who likes to understand things, so, you know, kind of ask questions about why things are the way they are, why people are the way they are, anything in that kind of domain, you get to do it. And, you know, as the PI in a lab, you get to decide what questions we're going to ask and how we're going to answer them and how we're going to tackle them. And so it's super exciting. You know, I think if you're someone who likes science, um, not necessarily hard science, you don't have to be into physics or bio or anything like that or chemistry, but just sort of likes thinking about things from a scientific perspective. Why is the world the way it is and wants to actually use empirical methods, research mm -hmm. to figure out answers, then it's such a great way to go. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I totally agree with that. Um, I think my favorite part of being in grad school um, is that at least the people I know, uh, there's not really another kind of position um, where you have the kind of autonomy that, that uh, grad students have uh, right. and sort of just the kind of work that you do. It really, you know, we get to sort of kind of, you know, go through our lives and, and be like, huh, that's an interesting thing about people. And then, you know, really sort of dedicate uh, kind of like rigorous study to it and I think that's uh, yeah just like a really amazing part of this uh, of graduate school and, and of being a researcher in general and specifically an academic researcher um, where you know you're really it's knowledge for the sake of knowledge right like we're, we're trying to learn things so that we can have a better understanding of the human mind and how we interact with each other uh, compared to, you know, other research like market research or things like that, where you're, you're doing research for a very specific purpose to find out a very specific thing. Okay. Ours is, uh, you know, we are sort of the disinterested truth seekers, um, I think <laughs> it is one way to put it. So, you know, I think there's, yeah, there's really no other way uh, that I know of to kind of really pursue what you're curious about and what you find most, most interesting. Mm -hmm. um, in like a really kind of uh, systematic way, like there is in grad school. Um, and, and another thing I think that's maybe just specific to UBC, we have such a great department and a really close knit community here. 
Um, so outside of kind of the the parts of being a graduate student that I really love, uh, it's the department here is also huge. Uh, it's so great, and I just love being a part of it. And I've talked to students who are graduate students at other universities who don't have that experience, yeah, and uh, sure. you know, it's 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 definitely something that uh, is is so great here, and something that you don't want to take for granted. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Well. This concludes our interview. Thank you, Dr. Tracy. Thank you, Eric, for taking the time and speaking with the labyrinth today. Um, it was truly an honor to have both of you over here. Oh, thanks so much. Thanks for doing it. It was, uh, it was really great to chat with you. And I hope students who are interested in the lab um, learned a little something about it and um, want to get in touch. As you can see, Eric is awesome and looking for RAs right now, I think. So there's a plug mm -hmm. for Eric. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, uh, definitely. Like maybe could probably use a, a couple of people who are interested in in uh, working during the summer and the, and the fall term next year as well. Um, but I don't want to tax too big <laughs> too wide of a net. <laughs> but yeah, thank you so much uh, for inviting us on, and it was it was a pleasure to talk to you. Likewise. Mm -hmm.